Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29. Thank you to our uh, our drama department. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, uh, for our choir and all of our hospitality workers. Good to see each and every one of you all in the house of the Lord. Good to see Jasmine in the house of the Lord. I was going to come looking for you, so I'm glad, glad you're here worshiping with us in the house of the Lord this morning. Genesis chapter 29. Uh, Uh, I'm going to start reading at verse 31. Genesis chapter 29, verse 31, and we'll read down to verse 35. We have it, say amen. Okay, let me read this in your hearing. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son and called his name Reuben. For she said, surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Yeah. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he had therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again yeah. and bore a son and said, now this time, this time will my husband become attached unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi, verse 35. And she conceived again and bore a son. And she said, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and ceased bearing. And the word of the Lord is blessed. Verse 35, and she conceived again and bore a son and said, now, Will I praise the Lord? Therefore, she called his name Judah, and she ceased from bearing. I want to talk about from love to praise. Amen. Talking about the, the correlation between love and, and praise, and hopefully it'll make sense after, after I finish. By your heads, let's pray. God, thank you. You're so good to us and so kind to us. Thank you, O oh God, that this is the day that you've made. We'll rejoice and we'll be glad in it. Thank you for your spirit that we feel in this place, God. And I pray that you would give me what to say to your people this morning. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that we might behold wondrous things out of your word. Someone here needs to be encouraged. Someone may be sad today. Someone may be confused today. Yes. Somebody may be discouraged today, but I wholly lean on your word, yes. knowing that you're able to do exceeding and abundantly. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Above all we could ever ask or think. Yes. So send your spirit that breaks every chain, that lifts the heaviness, that breaks through the darkness, oh God, and brings light. For the entrance of your word brings light. So sanctify us by thy truth, for thy word is truth. And we give your name all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in God's presence. I have been uh, talking about all month uh, about relationships and love and ideas around all of uh, those different kind of things. God bless you, musicians. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Um, so, so let me do this today. I, I, of course, if you've known me for any time, if you don't know me at all, I'm a church kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say I'm a church kid, it means that um, there was a group of kids who were born and raised in church in, in, in the sense that church was just germane to our household. It is what we did. My, uh, my grandmother um, was a musician. She was a church musician. Um, and um, I was thinking about this yesterday because I passed by 63rd and um, Morgan or something like that. And my grandmother's second husband was a pastor. And for a minute, she was a pastor's wife, which in my grandmother's case meant that she was basically the pastor <laughs> and she let him speak on Sunday morning. That's, that's what, literally what that, that probably meant. Um, but um, my father was a musician and my mother was a singer and we went to church all the time. 
I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand or can't identify with a generation of children who don't go to church, right. um, and they get have options to stay right. home. Right. Um, and I think we miss something when we don't bring our children to church. Amen. Um, one of the things that Mary and Joseph did with Jesus is they brought him to the temple. Yeah. Um, because I believe that the church sets up another social structure, another village per se, to help nurture and bring children. We become invested in our children when they come to church because we want them to be the best and we want them to be safe and all those wonderful things that we, we learned in church. But in, in my coming um, of age, when I was a child, it was like on the tail end of a classical Pentecostal wave um, that was in America and we went to church all the time. When I say church all the time, here's what I meant. <laughs> we went to church all the time. <laughs> uh, if there are seven days in a week, five of them we were in church. Uh, we were having church and maybe the other two we was just there for YPWW or youth meetings or youth nights. We would, we would go to church when we weren't having church just because our friends was going to be at church and we'd just meet up at the church just to hang out. It was just that kind of communal place to be. And so I think that the church still serves um, as a safe haven for young people and for children. Um, and I understand how powerful the role of church can play in uh, the life of young people. Um, the Bible says that we train up a child in the way he should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. I understand what it is to invest in children and see them become young adults and they kind of stray because they need freedom sometimes. And, and some of the kids that I grew up in church with, when they got a little older, they just rebelled. And when they rebelled, I mean, they went, it, if Jesus was one way, they went the opposite direction. They, they experimented, did all of the stuff that they told us not to do. Um, and some of them never made it back to church. Um, and the ones of us who did make it back to church, it, it is not that we rediscovered Christ or we rediscovered God, but that stuff that was put down in us yeah. when we were children, ultimately we can stray, but it, it draws us and brings us back. Um, and so I celebrate the role of the church and I still believe that the church is very, very important. But the problem that I take with the church or that kind of upbringing is that we grow up learning how to have good church. You cannot, to this day, you cannot beat us having church. We know how to have good church. We know how to speak in tongues. We know how to clap. We know how to sing. We know how to do all of those different kind of things. Um, we don't know how to have good home. Yeah. Or good life. As long as we're in church, we're fine. But you take us out of church and try to have relationship between people, and it gets kind of complicated because we have not developed the skills that it takes to sustain healthy relationships. We are good at having church because we spent a lot of time having church. What we have not spent a whole lot of time is talking about how do we have relationship with people when we are not in church. Right. And so what I have, I have observed, you can have two people who love the Lord, who are good at having church, and they do what church sometimes does. Is they, they, they come together, they fall in love, they get married, but then when they go home, they don't know how to relate to one another because in order to have sustainable, healthy relationships, there is some emotional intelligence that you have to have. There is some knowledge base that you have to have about how does a man communicate and how does a woman communicate. So you can understand the language because I want you to understand that communication is not just throwing words at each other. You could be throwing words at each other all day, but that doesn't mean you are communicating. To communicate means that I am understanding what you are saying to me and I comprehend emotionally what you are trying to convey to me. I cannot understand that if everything is about me. Here's my rule of thumb. It is hard to see other people if you're always looking in the mirror at yourself. Come on, yeah. help us. So you are good at, at, at knowing what you need and seeing what you need and looking at you. But when it comes that you looking at somebody else and what they need, 
we become dysfunction. And most of the dysfunction that we have is not that we don't know how to have good church, it's that when we can't sustain healthy relationships because number one, to have a relationship is to learn how to communicate. When I say communicate, I do mean understanding, but I also want you to understand that communication is empathy. To be empathic means that I share in what you feel. That means that if, 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 if I did something to hurt your feelings and now your feelings are hurt, I don't deny the fact that I did it and that you are feeling some kind of way about it, but I am present enough with you that if you are hurt, I am hurt too. I am hurt because my actions hurt you. And there is some caring, some empathy that needs to go along. You cannot just say, oh, I'm sorry, I did not mean to hurt your feelings. No, you cannot do that. That is not emotional intelligence. I need you to be hurt with me. I need you to feel, to try to feel what I'm feeling. Because if you hurt me and you say you love me, you should never want to do that again. And if you don't come into your relationships with the ability to see beyond your own feelings and your own needs and be willing to sacrifice what you want at any given moment and prefer somebody before your own needs, you cannot sustain a relationship. And, and I've never, when I was coming up, I've never heard church people talk about those different kind of things. You know what we say when, when, when people were having problems in, in their homes? Um, number one, they tried to hide it as much as possible. Right. Number two is, all they say was pray about it. Right. Right. And they called. When I was coming up, everything was a spirit. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they did. And that's what they did, and they tried to cast the devil out of everything. Everything was a spirit. Everything was the devil. If there was something wrong, there was, there was the devil. Yeah. But I want to say to you that everything is not the devil. Yeah. And everything is not a spirit. Sometimes the, the problem is you have two people who are in love with each other but don't know how to stay in love because love is not just a feeling. Never be hypnotized by the feelings of love or lust because those two factors would drive you to make a choice that you don't necessarily want to make. Here's what I always say. You can write this down if you want to, and uh, just keep it for you. Never, 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 never go grocery shopping when you're hungry. Right, right. And never get in a relationship when you are lonely. Right. If I am hungry and I take my appetite to the grocery store, everything looks good to right. me because I'm needy. And I need something in here. It's got to be something. And you might eat something when you are starving that you wouldn't do if you had a full stomach. In the same way, when you are take your appetites into your relationship and you get into them to trace away or to run away from your loneliness, you bring people into your life that if you was not so needy, you would not necessarily choose them to be in your life. Don't let the overwhelming feeling of loneliness or aloneness cause you to make a decision that you have to pay for for 18 years of your life. <laughs> I'm talking good this morning. Y'all ain't got to go with me. I'm going to do this because we need to hear this. And there are so many people who run from relationship to relationship because they don't know how to be alone. They have not mastered how to be alone. Yes. And if you cannot master how to be alone, you take that neediness into relationship and you end up smothering somebody. And then every time they try to be there for you, it's never enough because I'm needy and I'm clingy. And, I, and, and there's a difference between wanting somebody and needing somebody. Yeah. 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 And we take our needs to somebody. Yeah. But here's what the scripture says. God says this, that I will supply all of your needs. Bring me, God says, bring me your needs. Because I can satisfy your needs so that if you get into a relationship, you don't go into the relationship asking them to be to you something that I am supposed to be to you. And they don't have to be God for you. And when you make somebody God to you, you run to them with all of your needs. And if they love you, they try to meet them. But then you wear them out. Yeah. Yeah. 
Just wearing me out with you need everything all the time, every single day. But you have to understand that people have limited capacity. That is the truth. You only have so much to give. That's why you need to turn to God because he has unlimited capacity. I love God because for all of my neediness, he's okay with that. If I bring my neediness to somebody else and I keep drawing from them and I never replenish them and I just plug into them and I'm sucking all the life out of them, no wonder. No wonder they leave you. No wonder they leave you. Or they, they get to do something desperate, Devon. And they just die. <laughs> you wearing somebody out. You running up their blood pressure, running up giving them migraines, and they sick and you don't know why. Maybe, maybe it, it is because you have sucked the life out of them and deplete, uh, uh, depleted them to, a, to the point where in their body, their mind, in their heart, they have nothing else to give. Love is in your choosing. Love is in your choosing. And you cannot understand love if you don't understand free will. The ethic of love is a free will. Just because I love you doesn't mean you are responsible to love me back. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It did not say that the world saw the love and loved him back. He loved because he chose to love. He chose to love in spite of the fact that humanity had a free will and they could reject his love. Mm -hmm. Christ kept giving and giving and giving. And he says, Christ says this over um, in, 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 in Matthew somewhere, I think it's Matthew somewhere, oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, I would gather you like a hen does her, 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 her chicks, but, but you reject me. Yeah. It, when you love, there is a slight chance that the object or the person you love will not love you back the way you love them. And the problem is we want people to love us like we love them instead of learning their love language because what you may need in love may not be what the other person's need in love. And if you are going to be a lover, you also have to be a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be able to assume the responsibility to teach someone how to love you. Because we all come to love with a story, right? We all come with a history. And it could be as simple as someone could feel loved when you open the car door for them. Those acts of service, those small acts of service, that consideration that you, you, you pay attention to what I need and anticipate the need. And when you anticipate the need, that, that it says to me that you care enough about me, that I am on your mind, even during the course of the day, or even when you're at the grocery store and you pick up my favorite food, it means that you love me enough that my love and who I am is never far from your thoughts, so you will become considerate towards me. But sometimes we don't know why a person needs what they need. And if you need something that I don't need, I think it's silly that you need this. But why do you need this? Why, why, does, why does this matter to you? It should matter to you because it matters to me. Because you say you love me. I know you don't need what I need. I know it means nothing to you, but it should mean something to you if you say you love me. Yeah. Because love breathes through giving. For God so loved, the response was, I give. I give towards what I love. There's a scripture over in Matthew. Jesus talks about the parable of, of the pearl of great price is what we call it. The Bible says that a man found a pearl in a field. 
And when he saw how precious it was, the Bible says he hid it. He hid it in the field. He went and sold all he had, and he bought the whole field. Mm. Love, when you find something precious, yeah. right. let, me, let, me, I put, let me put a pin right here, and let me work this out. The Bible says, so Proverbs 31, who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, that he will have no need of spoil. She shall do him good and not evil all the days of her life. That the Bible begins to talk about it, ask the question, who can find a virtuous woman? Because a virtuous woman is, is precious. It presupposes that things that are of value are not always in the open. Who can find? It's not that it's not there, but the issue is, do you have the capacity to recognize the value of a virtuous woman? She may not be all in the open. She may not be on Soul Train, dancing out of Soul Train line. She may not, I mean, she may not, it may not be obvious. She may not be on a reality TV show or nothing. Just because it's out in the open doesn't mean it's precious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The uniqueness of this woman is her value. Yeah. And real value is not shown openly. Uh -huh. Come on, Brian. Precious things, yes. exquisite things, unique things. Yes. All right, you ain't going to find them at the plaza. Uh, uh -oh. That's right. Yes. You, you may not find it at River Oaks. Uh -huh. When you find something precious, you have to go to boutique stores. Uh -huh. right. Right. You know, like all of, you know, you go down on Michigan Avenue. And, and most people are going in and out of, you know, the, the Nordstrom's Rack or, or all that other kind of stuff. But there's a couple of stores on Michigan Avenue that a whole lot of people, they don't go into. Right. It's the Tiffany store. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Burberry store. Come on, man. It's the Louis Vuitton store. Yeah. It's the Ferragamo store. Because precious, unique, valuable things yeah. aren't at the mall. Right. You have to come to where they are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And because the commodities are so unique, they don't put them just anywhere. You can't get a Tiffany bracelet at Fort City. You, you won't find it there. You have to go to where it is because the manufacturer says that these things are so precious, I need to build a whole field around it. And nobody really comes in here unless they understand how precious these things are and how valuable these things are. So before they step over the threshold, you have to at least have in your mind, can I afford this? And my question to you about all your love and all the love you want, can you afford the love you want? Because love, real love, doesn't go on sale. Yeah. To have somebody precious in your life, it is a pearl of great price. And are you willing to go bankrupt? The Bible says he sold all he had. Yeah. Yeah. He went all in on this investment yeah. because this means much more to me than anything else. Yeah. It is a pearl of great price. So, so do you have what it costs in your heart to pay the price to have love? in your heart. <laughs> Who can find a virtuous woman? The, the Bible says that where a man's heart is, that's where his treasure will be. The characteristics, and this is important, I want you to hear me. The characteristics of a man in love shows up where he puts his money. If he doesn't, if he will not work for you, may not love you. Because what we love, we take care of. I have seen men work three or four jobs just to make sure his wife can stay home and take care of the house and the kids. Because this was precious to him. This meant more to him than his tiredness or the inconvenience. He worked three or four jobs. Yeah. Get him a side hustle yeah. to make sure that his wife and his children are taken care of. 
because whatever a man loves, he invests in. Yeah. Right. Have you ever seen men, uh, and, and we relate to cars like we relate to women sometimes. I've seen men who will buy a car and almost spend as much for the car, almost spend as much for the accessories. We're talking about brand new rims, tinted the windows, put a spoiler on the back of it. I mean, I've seen some guys do some elaborate things because this is what he loves. It's easy to do that with a car. It's not always easy to do that with the woman in your life. And it is about maturity and priorities. And if a man isn't willing to sacrifice for you, I challenge that he may not love you the way you love him. If he is not willing to put his money where his mouth is. Because people can say a whole lot. But love is in the doing. Right, right. And you get older, you're not fascinated or hypnotized by people's words. Uh -huh. I am comforted that your words and your actions line up. Yes. David said, let the words of my mouth yes. and the meditations of my heart, all, let it all be on the same page. Yes. So God, there's no question about my love for you yes. because you hear me say it out of my mouth and you see me do it in my actions. Yes. Yes. Love is in and our doing. And the problem is we come up in church and then we go home, and it's easy to talk to God. I know people who can speak in tongues all day. Can't talk to other people, though. Wow. They, they can't communicate well because they have not practiced what it is to communicate. Isaiah says, God says to Isaiah, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. It is not just what you say. It is important how you say it. Communication, just some principles of communication. It is not what you say, it is how you say it. Right. You can say the right thing right. the wrong way right. and destroy a conversation. Right. Right. It is not just what you say. It is not just about you being right. It is about you being able to minister words right. that bring life to a situation. Because your house is going to be built by what you say. And you have to be able to teach somebody how to talk to me. When you love somebody, and men have to be careful about this, that we don't use our words to tear down a woman. Because once you say it, you can't take it back. You can apologize for it. But you can say something in a moment of anger that you got to hear about for the next 10 years because she will not forget what you said. And she is not going to forget how you said it. So speaking comfortably to Jerusalem, let your words be sprinkled with some comfort. Let, let, let your words be caring and not use words as a weapon yeah. to tear down somebody yeah. that you say you love. Yeah. 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 Proverbs says that a soft answer turneth away wrath. Yeah. Yeah. That, that means that just because you are receiving wrath, and t emotional intelligence says that you don't have to meet wrath with wrath. Right. Okay. That if they're on a 10, you need to be at least a 5. Yeah. To bring the conversation down to seven at least. But if you meet a 10 with a 10, y'all go into 20. And then y'all start saying stuff in anger that you don't have the courage to say when you're not angry. Don't let your emotions say something out of your mouth that you cannot take back. So he is telling us a soft answer. Be careful how you use your words. Manage your emotions. Another thing church people are bad at. Yeah, tell us, tell us. Managing your emotions. Yeah. Putting all your feelings out all the time. Yeah. Just dumping your feelings on somebody and you expect them to take it. No, you have to learn how to possess your soul. Yeah. Just because you feel it doesn't mean you got to let it out. Yeah. It doesn't mean that, that because you love somebody or they say they love 
you doesn't mean you have to use them as a verbal punching bag. And say, just because you love me, you're supposed to stand here and take it. No, I don't. No, I don't. No, no, I don't. And so if you don't have these skills of how to be emotional or how to have an argument, there are healthy ways to have an argument. Number one, keep the main thing the main thing. Talk about the issue. Ain't got nothing to do with his mama. Ain't got nothing to do with his mama or his lazy father or his sister that keeps on coming up and dropping the kids off at your house. Ain't got nothing to do with that. That's not what we're talking about. Now, all that may be true, but that is not what we're talking about. This is not the opportunity for you to bring up old stuff and grievances. No, we're talking about a new refrigerator. That's, that's what the subject is. You have to be able to focus and to understand just because we have a difference of opinion, it doesn't mean that you're right and I'm wrong. Church people and intelligent people need to understand that we both can be right at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're both right at the same time. You're right and I'm right. Okay, so what we gonna do about it? Just because you're right doesn't make me wrong. You have to be able to, to hold two opinions in your head at the same time. And this is not about who's right, who wrong, who wins, who loses, because love says, Love says in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says that love does not take an account of offenses. All right. All right. All right. One of the things that young people do in, in marriage and relationships, they keep score. You know, we went to your mama's house on Thanksgiving, and I went over there and sat with your, your, your people, and I didn't want to. So now you owe me Christmas or you owe me thank you owe me the fourth of July and all that other kind of stuff. Love doesn't keep score like that. Another thing about love, and I'm gonna talk about my scripture eventually today. I might get to it, I might get back there, we might do it next week. But but the Bible says that love does not behave itself unseen. What does that mean? It means that you don't have a right to go to the family reunion, jump up on the table, and tell everybody that, that they belong to me and y'all can't talk to them no more. It doesn't mean because somebody cheated on you or whatever, you should go uh, punch out the windows in their car and key the car and slash their tires put sugar in the gas tank and all that kind of crazy, all that kind of crazy stuff. Right. It, it means that, and, and, and we really need, as this generation really needs to hear this, that if you got issues in your relationship, you don't go on Facebook right. and post all your business and say, I'm doing this because I, 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 I'm in love and I'm hurt. No. You are immature, right. and you're silly, right. and you don't need to be in a relationship with nobody. Right. Because ultimately what you do when your love feels violated, you throw tantrums. Right. And it amazes me how many adult people still throw tantrums yeah. like they're children. Yeah. And then they get on, get on social media and throw tantrums. And this doesn't make you look good at all. This is very unseemly. Yeah. This is very, very unseemly. And it is only because you have people who do not have the requisite skill set yes. to keep your business yes. your business. Yes. See, one of the things that, that we tell married people is, is that you have to be careful about sharing what goes on in your house. Because you can have an argument with your companion, your spouse, and then tell your mother about it. And then you and your spouse have worked it out. Y'all have moved on. Right. But when they walk into the house, your mother looking at everybody cross-eyed. Because she never resolved the issue that y'all resolved. And she's stuck in that emotional space because you heard my baby. That's all they care about. So here's what you could do. Keep your business to yourself. And I've seen so many people, and this is done in church. I've seen people come up and, and testify in the name of Jesus. I just want to testify that, you know, my husband, he's sitting right there with the kids. My husband ran out on me. He didn't come home last night. And we sit in the testimony service like, I just, what in the world? <laughs> what is this? 
<laughs> what is this? this going on? And they do it all in the name of Jesus. That's what they, they testify. I just want to testify that the devil is a liar. My, my wife didn't come home last night, but she's singing in the choir today. So, <laughs> foolishness. I'm glad to be saved, sanctified, filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. I just want to say hello to my wife. She in the choir. I ain't seen her last night. This boy just madness. Love does not behave itself unseemly. No, sir. There needs to be some dignity with how you carry your relationship. I have seen great women of great dignity and great strength, even though their husband was doing this, that, or the other. They never breathed a word about it. They didn't come to church looking like they had what they had just been through. They did not come to church and tell everybody their business. Sometimes they had to stand in prayer, close their mouth, and stand in prayer, and cover her husband even when he was wrong. There is some integrity that you have to have and some ethic that you have to have. Now, you can't control what somebody else does. But if it gets out what it should be said, it ain't come from me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm supposed to be talking about this scripture right here. Yeah. That's what I'm supposed to be talking about. Yeah. There is there's this passage in Song of Solomon where if you've never read the book of Song of Solomon, it's actually a converse, it's part conversation and it's part situational. It opens, and the, the husband and the wife, they're talking about um, the experience of how they experience each other's love. They talked about their physical features and how she smells, her perfume. And it's very beautiful, very romantic, very, very romantic language. And, and part of the language is, is that they begin to acknowledge God between them, right? Ecclesiastes says that two is better than one. But a threefold cord cannot be easily broken. God is the glue that holds two people together. When storms and situations comes against the house, God didn't get married to them. But when you invite God into your covenant, he can be the glue that helps you make it through some very hard times. So in, I believe, uh, chapter 2, the Bible says that the woman becomes very scared. Something happens in the middle of the night. It, it is when she reaches out for her lover, she realizes he is not there. And she panics, OK? She panics during the middle of the night. And she gets up out of her bed, puts on her clothes, and she goes searching for her lover. All through the streets, she is looking for her lover. Because when we are attached to somebody, when they leave us, they take a piece of ourselves with them. What real love is, let me tell you what, real, what, what, what part of real love is, is when I look at you and I see the part of myself that I have been missing. When I, when I look at you, you bring things out of me that I did not know that was there. That when, that, that when you, you love somebody, I am bringing you into my experience. And you have to be willing to let go of your own past experience to create this love experience that we have together. And there are so many men who are changed. There are so many men who, who like, you know, say, well, I, I've never ate fish before in my life. But they marry somebody who, who likes all type of fish and sushi and, and tilapia and all these different kind of things. And even though the man had never experienced it before, the way she cooks it, he eats it and enjoys it because she brings to him a different experience. Yeah, yeah. She opens him up to some things. And now he finds himself enjoying things with her that he never would have even experienced on his own because to love means you are expanded in your experiences. And if you take that away from me, you're taking a part of myself that I can only experience when I am with you. Yeah. So she rolls over in the middle of the night. She can't find that part of herself. She gets up out of the bed, searches all during the night. 
trying to find, have you seen the one whom my soul loves? That was her question. And she goes through the nights and goes through all night and finally she comes upon the watchman. What she did not know was that the watchman was watching her as she was searching for her love. Do you understand why we're all maybe searching for love? There's a watchman over us. There's somebody, there's somebody looking at me while I'm looking for it. The watchman found her and she asked him, have you seen him? Have you seen the one whom my soul loved? He did not answer her, but the Bible says that when she is with the watchman, the Bible says that she ultimately finds the one she loves. That when you in, the, the watchman is God. And when you connect with the watchman, you have some help yeah. while you are searching yeah. for the love you're looking yeah. for. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, preacher, you got time. I don't know what to do here. I'll start this and I'll finish it next week. I'm just going to give you a little bit of what I was going to supposed to be talking That's about, right. and I'll finish it next week. This story right here. Yeah. And in Genesis is one of the most beautiful love stories I think you will ever find in all of scripture. Uh, away from, you know, Jesus loving the whole world, not talking about human love relationship. It is, this is a wonderful, ah, uh, it's, it's so hard to get you to understand how powerful this is. Jacob has to leave his family because situations at home forced him to leave. The Bible says he happened upon a well one day, and it just so happened he wasn't even looking for her. Have you ever found something you weren't looking for? <laughs> he found something he wasn't looking for. He finds Rachel. The Bible says she was there tending to her father's sheep, and she was at the well trying to draw water. He sees her struggling. He doesn't run away from her struggle. Mm. He helps her. Mm. He says, no, I got it. I got it. Let me take care of this for you. The Bible says he draws water. They feed. Uh, they, they water the sheep. And the Bible says this. This is the Bible. I'm not making this up. The Bible says that he ran to her and kissed her and started crying. See, don't tell me men aren't emotional. Don't tell us that we don't have the capacity to feel deeply. Yeah. The Bible says that he loved her the first moment he saw her. Right. Did not know her name, her background, her story. All we see is that this man sees this woman and has this great rush of emotion. And the Bible says from the moment he saw her, he loved her. Gone. Heart taken. Love at first sight. It, it does happen. Yeah. It, 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 does, it does happen when you look into that person's eyes and you see something you have never seen before. They make you feel something that you have never felt before. And you know that this is it. If you are going to make a lifelong commitment to somebody, make sure that you can look into somebody's eyes and see into their soul and see a part of you and understand that I, I can't live without this piece of myself. The Bible says that this is before coitus. Y'all know what coitus is. Do I need to explain? No, I'm not going to explain. Y'all should know what. Look it up in the, in the dictionary. Before there is physicality, before there is intimacy, there is love. He loved her and he had never laid with her. He says, I've got to have you in my life. What do I need to do? And the Bible says, and she says that Laban is, uh, is my father. It just so happened that Laban was, in, was a relative of Jacob's mother. So technically, and you have to put this in antiquity, a long time ago, 
I guess because there wasn't a whole lot of people on the earth, that, that you married within the family or the kinship. Mm -hmm. So according to their tribal laws and cultural understandings of that day, that they had legal rights to be married because Israelites did not marry outside of covenant. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So they, 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 they decide to get married. I got to have her. Laban says, okay, you can have her, but you have to work for me seven years. Again, if he won't work for you, right. he doesn't right. love you. This is what the Bible says. I'm not making this up. Right. It says that. You can read it for yourself. The Bible says that it seemed to Jacob but a day. <laughs> seven years. Right. Just... It seemed like just one day for the love he had for her. Yeah. Seven years went by, and it was the equivalent for him of 24 hours because he was so enamored with this woman and the life that they wanted to have together. Because true intimacy is the exchange of dreams. Wow. When I love you, and I am bringing you in my life, one of the, the, the first conversations we have to have is what do you want to do with your life? Because God sent me into your life to make sure that you fulfill your purpose. So whatever I need to do to make your life what it needs to be so you can fulfill and have what God wants you to have, that is my role in your life. And, and you can't help a man do something if he doesn't know what he wants to do. You can't support a woman do in doing something and she doesn't know what she's supposed to be doing. Yeah. So love, marriage is a partnership. Yeah. I am partnering. I am making a covenant with you. And I promise God that before I close my eyes, you're going to be everything you're supposed to be. Yeah. I'm going to get you to where God says you're supposed to be because that is my role. It is not about, not about sex. It's not about buying a house. It's not about buying a car. It's a partnership of, of, of purposes here. Yeah. Yes. And that's why you need to be able to hook up with somebody who has a vision. Yes. Because what they do is help you unlock the vision. Yes. You may be thinking too small, but what the right person says, you could be much more than that. Yes. You can have much more than that. For all the gifts God gave you, you're supposed to be doing A, B, and C. You're supposed to be owning this. You're supposed to be owning that. And when they talk to you like that, they bring stuff out of you. Yes, sir. They unlock that for you. They, they, they help you unlock the treasure, release the treasure down on the inside of you. So that is the mystery yes. of, of marriage. That how can two people come together and God be between them and God get more out of them? It is only because when God sends me to you, he sends me to you. And now you're supposed to be filling your purpose. So if you have that in mind, arguing about the refrigerator seems silly. We got a bigger purpose here than, than just arguing over the refrigerator. Get whatever you want. But here's what we are going to do. We're going to follow the plan of God for your life. So they start planning their future together. See, but for a day for the love he had for her. Now it's time to get married. Jewish uh, marriage feasts are not one day. It is a festival. Everybody comes in from out of town. They set up camp, they drink wine and eat all day. There are, 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 are tenets and elements of their marriage ceremony. But after the marriage ceremony, this is the Bible, after the marriage ceremony, the Bible says that Laban, Laban switched women on Jacob. That when it was time to consummate the marriage, which was much more communal thing than we understand it to be in their day. It was important. And there was a celebration after the marriage was consummated because what the husband would do would come out with a sheep that had blood on it. And it meant that this woman was pure, she was a virgin, and the whole community celebrates now because a blood covenant has been established between these two people. But the Bible says on the night that Jacob was looking forward to, finally get to have what I've been working for. It's finally within my grip. I can have it now. I can own it now. The Bible says Laban switched 
sisters on him. This was the custom of their day. It was inappropriate for the younger sister to be married before the oldest sister. But Jacob left, Laban left that part out of it and he switched it without Jacob. And so Jacob wakes up in the morning holding somebody that he did not know. I gotta go. I gotta go. This is so good. Because there are some things you don't know about somebody till after you get married to them. And sometimes who you are engaged to and then who you wake up with the next day are two different people. And sometimes you don't know what you know until you know it. <laughs> you, 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 you don't know. And there are some things, some parts, and I'm using this as a metaphor, there are some, sometimes you get married to somebody thinking they're one person, and then you wake up a few days later, and it's like you don't even know who they are. Right. Wow. Right. It happens all the time. Yeah. Lay down at night with somebody, wake up with somebody else. And the question is, now I'm stuck in it. I'm here, and I, 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 I've married somebody who I don't know. Jacob wakes up with a stranger. And I, I just want to throw this out here because, again, we spiritualize everything. But this has nothing to do with the spirit. This is somebody, and I'm, I'm using them as an example because I've seen this over and over again in church, was that people portray one thing to get you to the altar to make that commitment. And then once they have you, they change. And they are one way at home. Could be the most evil, cantankerous, bitter person, and then go to church. Right. And they jump spiritual. Right. And the people at church yeah. see them one way, yeah. and then you go home with somebody who's another way. Yeah. They think they're an angel at church, but they're really the devil at home. Yeah. 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 And it happens in church all the time. Oh. Yeah. Jacob found himself in this complicated situation that he is married to somebody that he wakes up in the morning and he doesn't want them. That is not his fault. That's fair, right? He didn't fall in love with Leah. He didn't work seven years for Leah. If he would have been offered Leah, he said, I'm not doing this. I don't want her. I want somebody else, but life is complicated. And he wakes up, finds himself married to somebody that he does not want, and apparently he has no qualms about telling her, I don't want you. Right. But the Bible says, when the Lord saw that she was hated, she is married to somebody that hates her. I got to go. We got to do this next week. Because I'm not, I'm not going to be able to finish. We'll talk about it. Hopefully, I, yes, next week, I promise. You all come back for the part two. Stand to your feet. We got to go. Gotta just... These are the things we need to talk about. I pray it was a blessing. I know I was all over the place, but I, just, I hope you got something out of this. By your hands, God of heaven, thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your kindness. I trust that you said what you wanted to say to you today, God. I pray that we have heard what we needed to hear. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would bless us in our relationships how we relate one to another. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that as we come together as a community of Christians, that there will be love between us, that there will be empathy and understanding and caring and all of the things that we need in order to be a reflection of who you are. We love you, so help us to love each other, not just in church, but in our homes. In our, in our workplaces, amongst our brothers and sisters, amongst uh, husbands and wives, amongst uh, family members. God, help us to be 
uh, the people of love that you called us to be. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hug two or three people before you take your seats and just tell them I love you. Somebody may not have ever heard that this week. Love on somebody today. God bless them. I love you with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love you and ain't nothing you can do about it. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Take your seats real quick. Bow your heads today. If you're here and you say, I need to make a decision for Christ, what must you do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. If you don't know who Jesus is and you say, I want to know who he is, I want Christ in my life, you can't make that decision. If you're here to say, I am born again, but I need a church family, a church home where I can hear the Lord and be a part of a church family today. And you want to make that decision. You can make that decision today. Our hearts are open. Doors of the church are open. Is there one today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Clap your hands. Give the Lord a praise. Amen. I promise you next week. Lisa, the Lord say the same, and the creek don't rise. As my dad used to say, uh, we'll, we'll finish next week.